Is something wrong, Tom? Nothing a good stomach pump wouldn't cure. Hi everyone, welcome to Sasquatch. This is Season 2, Episode 2. Um, last episode was a little strange, a little weird. Then... Ooh, sorry. Hi, I'm Sean. And I'm Adam. And this is Sasquatch. Today we're going to be talking about the 1974 film, Shriek of the Mutilated. Yeah, so last episode was a little strange, uh, a little different from the stuff we normally cover, so we thought we'd get back to our bread and butter here on the show with a, you know, would you call this a horror film? Like a more traditional Yeti film? Pretty close to some of the stuff we've had before. It's got the same kind of tone. It's got the college professor and the kids and they're out looking for bigfoot we've seen this yeti. many times so it's a yeti this whatever time, though, yeah so. they're not having sex this time so that's good <laughs> um, you needed a break from i that. needed a break from that yeah yeti exists as surely as you and i one trait is universal the yeti has the uncanny ability to disappear into thin air as soon as modern man approaches there he goes again. Now, for tomorrow's expedition, I'd like you to all assemble in front of Wrigley Hall with luggage and equipment at precisely 8 a.m. The professor and just a few of the kids. I think it's four kids from his class. Once again, we've got a college class teaching Bigfoot. Um, and the professor's like, you know, he, he picks his favorite of the class, and then within his favorites, there's his extra favorite, and that's Keith. Keith. So the opening, like, section of the movie is all the kids are going to have a party, and then Keith's having dinner with Dr. Prell. <laughs> um, yeah, Keith is more or less our he's the main, main character. character. Yeah, I mean, he's... we don't want him to be, but he is. Did you enjoy the salad? It was fabulous. Yeah, so Keith's that's... just like a big bowl of hair the whole time. <laughs> they say his name a lot. They say Keith a lot. Some of my notes are like, oh, Keith, in quotes. <laughs> oh, a moment, Keith. Yeah, so the, I'll say the party that the kids have is an awesome party. That party looked really fun. So at the beginning of the film, there was a little, you know, in the opening credits of the movie, they were like, hey, by the way, this this has popcorn by Hot Butter. Yeah. And, and I wrote down, like, I can't wait to hear that. <laughs> And yeah, then we got, got to that scene, and I was like, I've already heard this many times. I bet you know it, too. Yeah. You just do. Yeah, I'm sure you do. The credits I don't know were if fun. I can, are we allowed to like be like, oh, this is what it sounds like? Or yeah, we can play popcorn. Us? Anybody want any popcorn? sounds like a lot of plot before the kids get there but like those first 10 minutes are wild you've got the popcorn party which is actually popping yeah and you really want to go to that party and then there's keith having dinner with first of all if i go to dinner with a doctor professor and that's the restaurant we go to where there's like i swear there was hay on the floor <laughs> and they're eating this like supposedly oriental dish that's like shrouded in mystery what is it anyway Oh, it's a combination of wild meat. The natives call it gin song. And I'm like, where are we in the world? Like, where does this film... It says this film takes place in Boot Island. There's something about it that feels Canadian. After the party, where we're introduced to Spencer, who, uh, that's a good, this is a good uh, way in. You know, I told it, I said it was about a professor and the kids with, you know, going out together to look for Bigfoot or, you know, find Bigfoot or whatever. The Eddie, sorry, the Eddie. Please stop. Should his tail should stop. Stop listening to Pearl's madness. And so Spencer is an example of that last time. I guess he came from somewhere and he knows this professor from where he worked before or was before. And he went on one of his trips to find the Eddie there and all of his friends died and he was deeply troubled by the experience. 
and um, and so he's like telling all them this dark story at the party. He then... wanders into the party. He immediately is rude to his like wife, girlfriend. Just yells at her sister. I thought. Better give me a drink. Start. He just starts. He He's soon so as... dramatic. It's hilarious. But you can't hold Dr. Pro responsible. <laughs> I guess he's like a, the gardener now and he used to be a teacher, but was also one of Dr. Prell's students that went on Dr. Prell's last field trip to a different place where he was the sole survivor besides Dr. Prell of the Yeti attack which they're letting Dr. Prell go on a new field trip to find the Yeti, despite him now living and working in a different place. So he, so that's the thing that I'm like, that's strange that like Dr. Prell's over here and like he's doing a Yeti hunt for his schoolwork and then now he's at a new school and he's like, well, yeah, there's, of course there's a Yeti nearby here too. And yeah, and the way it's they like deliver this truckload sense. of information is Spencer starts yelling, no more field trips! No more field trips! I said I thought there'd be no more field trips! They said there would be no more field trips. Spencer, don't get so excited. That's all over with. That's all in the past. Here, dear. Have a drink. So he's ruining the pop the popcorn party. <laughs> Ruins the popcorn party. You're watching it. It doesn't matter who you are at this point. You're watching the movie. And it just cuts to, like, Spencer and April coming home. And that two minutes is a perfect two minutes of cinema. Just perfect. Yeah, and he's just sitting in the bathtub with like a sponge or a brush. And I think it's more like a brush. Beer can. Yeah, beer and he's just in there in all his clothes, and he's just like <laughs> wiping his shirt with a brush. And then probably my favorite part of the entire movie, definitely the best cut part. to low angle, like looking forward at a, the edge of a couch, and then from behind the couch slides a toaster. <laughs> And then behind it, uh, April, who's like, I just had her throat slit, but is still alive as she like pushes this toaster that must have a crazy long cord yeah. all the way across this living room and into the bathroom without him noticing somehow at all. And then she gets right up next to the bathtub and just she sells the toaster that this in. is her dying breath too like yeah. she definitely just left this she, the earth as soon as the toaster went yeah. over the edge she <laughs> pushes the toaster in and then like lays over and just dies <laughs> we're never never come back to it's, there we, that doesn't matter for anything else in the story no at there's all. no investigation or anything like that I'm so sorry sorry about Spencer he is a dear friend I hope he didn't upset you he does carry on about that episode. I suppose it was dreadful for him. Once you get to Boot Island, things like you meet, you really feel like you meet the kids there. Like you got to see Keith, um, you know, eat out you know, Dr. Prell's butt at dinner with their salads, you know. So the van opens, their 70s van, it's gotta be Keith's van, um, <laughs> opens up and you get Karen, Tom, Lynn, and then Keith's the fourth one. Carl, allow me to present my students. This is Karen Hunter, Karen. Lynn Kelly, Lynn. and Tom Nash. Tom. And this young man is Keith Henshaw. 
Oh, <laughs> an extreme pleasure. Lynn's got her big glasses. That's kind of it for her, but I like her big glasses. She sleeps in her big glasses, talks in her big glasses, you know. And then she has a couple scenes where she's not wearing glasses, though. That's true, I guess. Because I, I thought she was someone else for a little bit. And then I'm just like, why do you give a character <laughs> such a distinctive thing? And then you take it away because now I don't know who she is. <laughs> Because I'm just not watching that hard. And she um, she has a crush on Tom. And Tom just sucks. That's his only character trait, is Tom sucks. Uh, what's the action like on Boot Island? Beg pardon? Well, I mean, what's the place like? Where do you go at night? Tom is a jokester. He's a joke, is what I wrote down. Uh, I knew I forgot something. <sighs> Prevents frostbite, my boy. She literally. I don't remember she goes, any examples of that. Oh, here, Tom. I brought you some some warm. I forget if it's coffee or tea, but he's just like, here you go. I got you something, and he's just like, this sucks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just like, well, screw this guy. <laughs> this guy sucks. Like that's all you give me. I hope it's still hot. Oh, this is crap. Keith, Keith is just a little like he's oh, a little teacher. Yeah, pet Keith's, Keith. Keith's definitely at the bottom. <laughs> uh, no, Karen's at the bottom. Karen's. At the, I, I was gonna put Karen at number two, and I then and then uh, Tom, and then Keith at the bottom. Here are my notes for Karen. Karen is mad at Keith for having passionate sex with Doctor Prell last night instead of her. Karen is angry. That doesn't happen in the film. That's that's Sean embellishing upon the relationship <laughs> between Keith and Dr. Prell. Are you still mad at me? You didn't say two words to me the whole ride up. Now you're doing the same thing here. Look, I told you about last night. I couldn't get away. Well, you could have called. I lost all track of time. Before I knew it, it was midnight. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'd like to unpack. She is mad at him, though. She's literally she sitting there with she her wanted, arms She wanted Keith to folded. come to the party, and she's really mad that Keith didn't come to the party because instead he went to, like, this exclusive dinner with his, like, professor instead. And, and he and ate, ate a salad and there, too. He also had soup. He had gin sung. Keith, to success. Yeah. 57 minutes. Now Karen is yelling in the greenhouse. 58 minutes, 30 seconds. Karen starts yelling again. Ah! Ah, you were delirious, Karen. Karen's the it's one who... Literally all she does is scream for... At least Karen wanted to leave when people started dying. Sure. She doesn't leave, though. It's literally you walk across a bridge to get off the island and no one can... That's true. They don't need to go with her, and she doesn't leave because they outvote her. Give me the keys to the van. I can't do that. The majority rules that we stay here. Keith? All right, so you get, you get to the island. They meet Dr. Carl. Who's this guy who lives there? He studies he's flowers. He's like their local contact, and he's like seen Bigfoot, or he's seen the Yeti before. Um, and then so... this Laughing Crow is the last guy there. Yeah. We'll set him aside. Laughing Crow will circle, will circle back. A cloud passed away from the moon, and for one split second, I thought I saw something. A shaggy figure standing just at the edge of the tree line. Instantly, it was gone. They go in the woods and they look for the Yeti and think Tom just, Tom gets it. And then they're like, where's Tom? What's happening with Tom? And eventually they find Tom's leg. And then I think uh, that Lynn gets eaten at the greenhouse. And I was sad. I was like, mm, she's gone. Now I've just got Keith and Karen to hang on to. I guess this proves it's not Tom. Honey, stop treating me like a child! Stop acting like one! Dr. Proud brought you on this mission for a reason! And up to now you've been acting like a, a whimpering, self-pitying little girl! Um, and then there's like a whole section where Dr. Prell's trying to use the dead meat of the kids to like catch the Yeti. At one point they've got Tom's leg in a trap, and it was really funny because it cuts to like the meat 
that he's cut off of Tom's leg and it's clearly a steak. There's like the steak bone in it. <laughs> so their plan is to flash a light at the Yeti and then Tom's going to shoot it with tranquilizers. Uh, initially, they were going to have Carl take pictures or shoot it with tranquilizers, but Carl says he's all thumbs. Tom was dead by so then. They Carl were using... doesn't get a job. Sorry, not Tom. Um, Keith. Keith. I got Keith. them confused. Teacher's pet Keith got the and, tranquilizer uh, gun. Yeah, I don't know who did the light. I guess the professor. And then Karen took pictures. Swing that light over there. <laughs> Come back, you fool! Carl did nothing. Um, and that is because <laughs> we come to find out very shortly after that that Carl is the Yeti. Yeah, so... <sighs> so Dr. Carl is the Yeti. There's so much to unpack with the end of this movie. Yeah, there's a whole lot. That's why I just wanted to there's get the... to that part. One more exposure should do the trick. What do you suggest? Well, we've pulled practically every trick out of the bag. Maybe we should just kill her like the rest and be done with it. There's the crazy <laughs> first 20 minutes where you get the popcorn party and the toaster scene and you're like, what am I watching? Yeah. Then there's like 30 minutes of just like boring 70s mm -hmm. kids. Yeah, so the, the, the toaster scene's 15 minutes in and I was having a lot of fun. I was enjoying the movie. And then at 34 minutes in, so only 20 minutes later, I, I wrote that I was bored. Yeah, you're, you're stuck with the kids and these two guys in this cabin having zero fun, not really doing anything. They're not really like out there looking for the Yeti. Hear him howl, here comes the Yeti now. Yes, he does sing a Yeti song. Um, it, uh, it was pretty funny. So you just kind of sit through that, <laughs> and you get to the end, and it's revealed that... This whole thing is a ruse by Dr. Prell and Dr. Carl and Laughing Crow. In and an international, their, yeah, international group of cannibals, the Finger People. An international cabal of satanic cannibal. Yes, they worship um, um, elitists. Ball Baresh. And we invoke the beneficent presence of the Lord Baal Barith on this assembly. Keith is in the woods with a gun. And he hears the Yeti. And then Laughing Crow, who's like secretly working the stereo system, screws up. That weird stereo. Plays... Why do they have the stereo? Oh, because to, to make the Yeti sounds. Idiot! <sighs> So Laughing Crow screws up the audio, and Keith sees a speaker in the tree, and he's just like, what is that? And somebody knocks Keith out. Then it was you that hit me with that rock! No, no, that was Carl. He was the Yeti, naturally. Laughing Crow operated the light network in his absence. But Karen was right about Tom. Ernst, enough of this. The clock has struck. Let the Saturnalia begin. Uh, yeah. Then they, like... Somehow, I kind of forget what Karen. So what? So there, they keep Karen in the house, and they've got kind of like a Rosemary's Baby situation going on for a minute there, where they're trying to trick her, fool her, and then you end up finding out the reason they're doing this is because they need her to die of fright, because that makes people taste better because these. No, you're you're going up. You're giving them too much credit, man. Because there's the whole scene where Keith bursts in to confront the yeah. doctors and the cabal of satanic that's, people. That's when... And they literally say, <laughs> like, oh, this we're just theatrical people. Keith we, comes in with this ridiculous white sweater, and he's just like, I'm putting a stop to this. And I'm just like, Keith and his white sweater are going to put a stop to this room of strange individuals. <laughs> you're doing or who these people are but i'm gonna put a stop to it right now i knew you'd be back i demand to see karen it's so it's it's so weird at the end when they get everyone around the table and it feels it's like 15 minutes but it feels like a, an 11 hour movie 
about these boring people explaining to each other about how excited they are to do this thing to again eat, that they've people. done before. You see, Keith, the movement is extremely fond of what you might call theatrics. To kill solely for the purpose of satisfying the appetite would be uh, primitive. And then you find out that it's all, it's not, the Yeti's just a costume and that it's actually like theatrical international cabal of cannibals. And you're just like, Whoa. you're trying to process that and they keep going and keep saying thing after thing that doesn't make sense. And they're like, we're actually French. And they're like, we're French satanic cannibals. But well, that we're was just another. Now. That was just the the guy from the European chapter. He, but then, that doesn't mean they're all French. It just means you're like, trying to keep. Although up, they, they did say they prefer Carnassier. They sit <laughs> down and they like get out. It's not even a phone. He like puts a can next to his ear and he's like playing the phonograph or whatever it is. And he calls some like someone and it cuts to this like picture on the wall of some old guy and you hear his voice and he's like it's all going well and he's like "Ooh, that sounds good over the over the whatever whatever that was called i'm sure it's a thing that they used to use to call each other then my choicest blessings on you your group and on the lamb of Antares. were there any complications well the one selected to carry the uh, yeti legend back to the people has discovered the truth but do we may succeed here nevertheless. I think they just they just wanted to feel like their plan worked because it was such a bad plan and they put so much thought into so little that they just wanted to feel like it worked because like imagine you're Dr. Carl and you're putting that suit on. How many times are you not scaring someone before finally they don't even they don't even scare her with the yeti, they scare her with laughing crow. Yeah. They, <sighs> That's what actually scares her to death. It's because Laughing Crow is hiding in the bathroom with the knife. Yeah, so the end like of the movie... Like a game of Clue or something, she runs to hide in the closet and she opens this tiny little closet and he's just sitting in there like, Hey, I've been in here for two hours <laughs> hoping you'd run into this place. <laughs> yeah, she dies of fright. Keith bursts in. Keith and the, the, thank, the evil Thanksgiving dinner scene happens. They wheel out dead Karen and they're like, We're... We're going to indoctrinate Keith so that he can go and spread the tale of the Yeti. Because somehow if we make people think a Yeti killed these kids, no one will start, no one will question Dr. Prell. And I'm just like, that doesn't make any sense. The second field trip that this guy's come back with no kids. And you're like, <laughs> someone's going to start to suspect Dr. Prell. The Yeti thing does not... No, cover yeah. that at all. No, it does. It just adds a totally <laughs> unnecessary extra step. Time is at hand, Keith. Join us or join Karen. And then they're like, and we we know that Keith will go with it because they're like Keith won't want to tell anyone that he ate people, so he'd rather lie and say that the Yeti killed his friends than let anyone know that he ate some of Tom or Lynn or whatever unknowingly and it's like come on guy you know if somebody yeah. killed Adam and fed him to me under the guise of like here's some Chinese food and I ate it and then they were like that was Adam I would still tell his parents I'd be like hey some people killed him and, and fed him to be other people like they'd want to know Right, I wouldn't. I wouldn't feel guilty at all. So, like, I don't. <laughs> I, I you feel a little bit guilty. No, I, I. I. You know, someone said, "Here's some some you know Empress chicken," and, and it was just like, ah, it was Adam. I try and like, ruin my Empress chicken. Mr. Henshaw, white meat or dark? Uh, and that's the end of the movie, yeah. There it is. Um, so yeah, uh, it's... <coughs> I don't like the twist that there is no Bigfoot. You know, I think there's two conversations. There's the twist that it's not the Yeti, and then there's the fact that it's the international satanic cult, the theater troupe people. 
because uh, that doesn't make any sense at all. But put that aside. It, this is a twist that happens in multiple Bigfoot films. That we're gonna get the fake Bigfoot. Yeah. yeah. The the so Bigfoot's gonna turn out to have just been a person in a costume, which is definitely what this one looked like. Well, we we didn't finish talking about. My favorite, my other favorite, favorite, favorite scene is the one where Karen wakes up when they've got her like held hostage and they like, she finds the bodies in the greenhouse and then it's a dream and then she wakes up again and then she goes to the window and then looks out the window and from very far away, like that scene from Monty Python, you just see the dude in the Yeti suit just booking it down. Apparently this old man, Carl, (laughs) just (laughs) booking it down this hill. And he's like trying to run sideways a little bit so he doesn't just start tumbling. I would say I have never seen the twist where it's like, oh, I'm going to watch this Bigfoot film and get to the end and it's like, it wasn't really Bigfoot. That does, I hate that twist. I've hated it every single time I've encountered it. I don't I, mind it at all because I don't really care. I, I mean, <laughs> sure, I guess if you are being forced to watch the films, then who cares how it ends? But if you go and you're like, Oh, I'm gonna spend four ninety nine on this Bigfoot movie. And you go home and you watch it, and at the end of the movie, it's like, haha! Is not only have I seen this before, but I, there's literally another movie that you put on, and at the end of the movie, it's like it's not Bigfoot, it's cannibals. And I'm like, God, that's not that's does. I'm not like, ooh, cannibals. I'm. Like, <laughs> you like cannibals, though. I like cannibals when I want to put on a cannibal movie, but like, how is it satisfying to be like? Oh, I'm gonna put. We're gonna tell them it's this thing, but it's just not. It's like it's not. It's, there's a difference between like a film subverting your expectations and a film just lying, just being like, <laughs> yeah, the Yeti's on the cover of the movie. They'll once they bought it, they can't return it. Like we've got their money. I'm certain it was you. No, it was you who first crept up the side of the house, and it was you who frightened her first. I know. But it was you who delivered the coup de grace at the stairs. I'm certain she was still breathing then. Purely residual, Carl. Carl and goes to you. Yeah, it does, their plan, Dr. Carl and Dr. Prell's plan, makes absolutely no sense to me from any direction that you approach it. Um, the movie doesn't make sense to me as far as, like, why would you do that? Why not just have the Yeti kill the kids like that's all anyone who puts this on wants to see is the yeti kill the kids and you give us so much random crazy like curveballs you've got the popcorn party the toaster scene tom's on the piano the toaster <laughs> scene is something that i legs. that i wanted i just didn't know that i wanted it <laughs> i i feel like i'm gonna say now i don't think that it's possible that i'm gonna put on any movie that's a Bigfoot movie, and at the end, if it's not, if Bigfoot doesn't show up or it's not Bigfoot, I'm not happy. I don't like that twist. I, I find it deeply frustrating. Um, we'll probably see that happen more throughout the show. We will be seeing that happen more. So Sean will be disappointed sometimes, maybe even more than me. I yeah. think maybe this was one of those cases. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, you must be laughing, Crow. Is it time for dinner? Yeah. Something about this film that, that's a little deeply troubling to both of us, though, is it's pretty racist. Yeah, no, it's I... It's got some pretty, like, difficult... Like, the whole character of Laughing Crow is a difficult character to deal with. And then when the characters at the end show up that are part of the worldwide cannibal cult, they're not much better, even though they're seldom on the screen. But like the the whole, it's it's a troublesome movie in in those ways. But look at him, he's strong as an ox. He works from sun up to sundown, and he obviously never complains. And on top of that, he's the finest native cook I've had the good fortune to find. 
I, I don't know if it's a belt or a crown or a badge. However, Pat wants to like interpret this award. We're giving it to Shriek of the Mutilated. Most racist thing we're going to cover. I really hope nobody steals that title. But yeah, Laughing Crow. I looked into the actor. I can't find proof that that man was not a Native American. But when I look at him, I think like some Italian uncle at like a picnic table with lots of like food around like he does not then yeah there's the casting there's the fact that he can't talk so every single scene yeah they talk about him being like dumb and he's like also silent and it's just like yeah a lot of that is like it hurts hurts. every time he's on screen it hurts and that would be enough to get the, the award but then at the very end of the movie on top of the betrayal, on top of the Yeti isn't real, on top of we're an international cabal of French satanic theatrically oriented foodies, you get what's his name, King King uh, Ochibamba, and some kid from like India. And King Ochibamba, your safari service has furnished us with and you, your highness, for the incredibly clever dispositions of your late father. I can't help but feel that he's here with us at this moment. Um, okay, so that's, what do you think about um, how the movie was made? What do you, what do you think about the any Honestly, technical... I was worried right away when, when we got into that big auditorium room with the professor and the kids again. I was like, oh my gosh, this is gonna look awful, it's gonna sound awful. A lot of the older movies we've covered have been like that. Not so much here. I think it gets better as it goes, but every now and then, it'll have a, a shot where I'm just like, what, what, what is that? Like, I need glasses as big as lens to figure out what I'm looking at. Like, when Spencer's telling you his flashback, it, they whitewash it to the point where like I really it looks like we're in the middle of a blizzard and there's no way to tell what is happening it's like a scene of the yeti is supposed to be attacking him and it, uh, you can't tell if you're looking at a man mowing his lawn or like the highway like you just don't know what you're looking at <laughs> In the scene where she goes to look out the window and sees the Yeti running down the hill, she goes to the window, and as she goes, it looks like it's, like, dark outside. And then she goes to the window, and it's, like, broad daylight. Like, it's as opposite as it can look. Um, I did some... I looked into the filmmakers behind it. Um, It was made by uh, Michael Finlay, and it was shot by his wife, uh, Roberta Finlay. And they were a team of filmmakers that made a lot of amateur pornography in the 60s and 70s together. Uh, and then you know? they also made some horror films. Sometimes those two bubbles would cross over, I believe. Um, I think he edited uh, Invasion of the Blood Farmers or something like that. It's kind of a more well-known like cult B 1972 kind of deal and so then they got this right. and this was their big break to not make porn anymore um, oh okay so after this they went on to make a few more things and then I think it was 1987 Michael Fenway tragically died in a horrific helicopter accident along with like five or six other people oh. and they were trying to walk up onto the helicopter and one of the landing uh, P, whatever that broke and the helicopter tipped, tipped over. over. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I was like, "Whoa, that's a crazy way to go." And then after that, his wife continued making uh, horror films, and I believe went into hard, started shooting hardcore pornography too. So I, I was like, I really want to watch a movie about the Finlays. That sounds like a crazy story. Uh, so someone should look into making that movie. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a pretty crazy story. Yeah, what a life had uh, of course uh, hundreds hundreds and hundreds of sessions here and most famous people staying Wilco uh, Nora Jones Sonic Youth uh, Lou Reed uh, Paul McCartney David Bowie did his album here so, um, all right so what, what do you rate this film uh, two and a half two and a half big feet two and a half big feet mm-hmm. um, I'm gonna give it two 
No, you know what? I'm going to give it one Bigfoot. Because I genuinely, I don't like the twist. I think it's a stupid twist. But I'm going to give it a big one Bigfoot and one toaster. And when we get to the end of the season, I'll figure out what the value of that toaster is. But it only gets one Bigfoot and one toaster from me. Welcome to the Bigfoot Breakdown. The Bigfoot or a Yeti and Shriek of the Mutilated is, in fact, a dude in a suit named Carl. It does beg the questions, though. They say that this Bigfoot uh, is super stinky. Uh, I don't know what he's doing to make the suit super stinky. I guess if he just doesn't wash the suit, it probably smells pretty bad. I mean... Um, they, they say, they say uh, bullets, your bullets won't work. Uh, oh, that's because they were blanks, so yeah, it's not bulletproof. Put them on! Try me. Be reasonable, Keith. I mean, that's the thing. You can say they said a lot. They said his middle toe was really big. Like, it's all a lie. Well, they could just do that with the costume. I mean, again, it's a costume, though. So like, said he was cold to the, somebody said he was cold to the touch. And I'm like, who's that person? Like, how are they doing? Is there like, is he wearing ice in there, or was it one of them that said that? Might have been one of them. You can dress it up all you want. It's still a dude in a suit named Carl. Yep. <laughs> not coming back. Welcome to Stat Squatch, where we crunch the numbers. So in this film we had five deaths, four of them were human on human violence, and one of them was scared to death. There was one yeti, although really there were zero yetis. The one non-Yeti that was in the film was there for one minute and 57 seconds, but really, of course, it was zero. And this film took place, as far as we can tell, on Boot Island, which is outside of Nova Scotia. Okay, so here's Maine, and here's the Bay of Fundy. So if we go in the Bay of Fundy, there's this tiny little spot where it dips back in, because there's this little jut, little jetty over here dips back in here in the, into the uh, Bay of Minus, and in there, that's where Boot Island is. That's it for Stat Squatch. Sasquatch. On the next episode of Sasquatch, we are going to be venturing into a new genre for us. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we're not going to be covering horror or pornography. There's a whole other world of movies. That sounds great. That that honestly sounds great. Yeah, no, we're going to be getting into Okay, it's something, what, what? Family films. Okay, are, are we going to, we <laughs> finally doing Harry? Harry and the Hendersons? You would think that we would have covered Harry and the Hendersons by now. I feel like it's the big, it's like probably, like, I think we've said it before, I think it's like the most successful, probably, Bigfoot movie Most well-known, beloved film to ever feature the big man. No, we're going to be covering Cry Wilderness. <laughs> Your father is in great danger, Paul! <laughs> Where are my raccoons? Are these your raccoons? What's that? Sasquatch. Did they decide to have the popcorn machine and like make that scene and then get the song? Or were you there like, we like this song, we want it in our movie? Which is probably the case because the song by Hot Butter came out in 1972. So only two years before this, it was a big hit. But the funny thing there is, is that the song is not by Hot Butter originally. Hot Butter really? covered the song Popcorn. So then that, that begs the question, did Hot Butter... Were they just like, we need to cover this song because we're hot butter and that's popcorn? <laughs> or was it a couple of guys and they're like, look, let's do our own version of popcorn. And they're like, that's sweet. And people were like, that's cool. And they were like, you should make a band. And we're like, well, what's our band? And they're like, well, popcorn's our only song. And they're like, well, 
hot butter. I don't know. What do you think came first? Do you think they were already cold? What do I I'm think sure there's came an answer. Hot right butter there. or popcorn? Yeah, which I'm, came first, the butter or the popcorn? 